So, hi, Samarth. Thank you so much for joining uh, me in the Hyperloop Tube right now. Um, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join. Hey, Blake. As a huge fan of In the Hyperloop, I'm so excited to be on your show. Thanks, man. Um, so, I've been following uh, your team, and you just recently posted a really interesting blog post titled uh, The $10 to the Fifth Delta Hyperloop in 2019. Did I get that title correct? <laughs> yeah, the 10 to the 5th Delta, the $100,000 Delta, yeah. <laughs> so why, why did you feel that uh, you wanted to write this article? Um, Basically, um, so I'm, I'm the, I was the business team lead for Hyperloop at UC Davis, also known as One Loop. Uh, and, you know, like as any other Hyperloop team, you know, we've, it's, it, we've come a long way. We started out with like, you know, getting a grant for $2,000 and thinking we were the coolest guys in, in the world and bought pizza for ourselves with that money to now having like, you know, uh, upwards of $30,000 and like feeling that we're inadequate and completely like failures in terms of raising money. So we, you know, like, you know how it goes as you start to like build a product, especially in engineering, like uh, as, as it gets more complex and more sophisticated, um, you tend to spend a lot more money. Um, the reason I came up with this article is like I, I was not able to attend the Hyperloop competition this year, um, but I I have been like a huge supporter of uh, my team and like I've also been trying to like work with my team to see how we can develop um, Davis and the Sacramento Valley region into a place where a Hyperloop test track could eventually exist. Um, so. I, from that lens, I, I've been kind of like following what other teams have been doing in terms of like their uh, lookout in building Hyperloop companies and building test tracks and Hyperloop companies. Mm -hmm. And I felt that like, um, I, I read the article from, I think it was, uh, I forgot his name, Ethereal Boving Bovington, like mm -hmm. on TechCrunch mm -hmm. about like Team Munich winning. And yeah, yeah. he said, he said like, oh, I, I, there's like a delta of like hundreds of thousands of dollars between the smallest team and the largest team. And I was like, yeah, there really is. Like, and nobody's really talked about this. And that's such a good way to put it. It's like this delta that exists um, you know, in, in Hyperloop yeah. uh, between the teams. Um, so basically, like, what I wanted to, to do is like, talk about the different types of Hyperloop like, businesses that even exist mm -hmm. um, and, wh and why teams should be worried about this delta. Um, because I don't think, uh, you know, it seems like a, it seems like a good thing, right? Like, oh yeah, like, you know, the teams that are starting out, they, they don't have that much money. And the mm -hmm. teams that like have a more established and have like a more permanent engineering faculty that's helping them with Hyperloop, obviously they're going to like have more money. Mm -hmm. But, um, what's happening is the competition is not, is obviously becoming more sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, Elon Musk at the beginning of last week. Or right at the end of the competition, it was like, oh, it's gonna next year is gonna be like in the six mile tube, yeah. and then we're gonna have uh, you know a, a tunneling competition as well. And while I think that's amazing, it's not like SpaceX is offering any more support to teams when they're adding this level of sophistication. But they're adding they're adding more uh, stuff, but then they're expecting the teams to kind of like like bridge that gap basically, yeah. and that really just will make the more sophisticated teams. Like even more sophisticated because they've already been doing things like this, and then the teams that have been like, you know, kind of struggling to stay aboard and like, you know, attend the competition and get people in their university excited about it mm -hmm. and in their town excited about it, they're gonna start to like do less because they're gonna feel like they can't really compete because um, mm -hmm. the competition is just getting so much more expensive. And while this this exists in like you know other competitions like you know Formula mm -hmm. E or Baja or like AMAT or any of these other engineering competitions, the mm -hmm. competitions give you um, you know, good connections with sponsors, the competitions, um, they, they have a pretty set recipe for like what some of the things that they're looking for every year. So mm -hmm. you kind of know going in what the workload is going to be. Whereas Hyperloop is like starting a new company. Like every team is a new company, like yeah. looking at how they want to do things, how they want to like really, um, get, some, get money, how they're going to partner with the university, how they're going to keep intellectual property, like so many things that you didn't think you would have to think about doing an engineering competition, like you suddenly have to think about because what you're trying to do is huge. Yeah. And I mean, these, these uh, pod competition teams are starting to recruit. Do you hope uh, that teams, you know, take, read this article? Um, yeah, most definitely. I hope they read this and like, yeah. they, either, they, they realize that like, um, 
that there there are a lot of like especially for people who are try, trying to get started in Hyperloop that there are a lot of like other teams who feel that there is this huge like gap and are more than willing to like you know talk about how how they could possibly help and give advice. I know our team has been like you know in pretty close communication with uh, University of Washington and. Um, University of Waterloo and, uh, and pe- members from other teams who have like you know also been trying to build things so I, I definitely hope that they feel like less afraid to get into this um, and then another thing is that I hope they um, like I hope the larger teams like realize their importance because yeah. I think that like they, they they look at themselves as small startups and so they're comparing themselves to like you know Hyperloop One and like they're comparing themselves to even like Pebble and other actual like tech startups, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's like it's it's crazy how they do this because like they're definitely like they 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 were an engineering team that takes in mostly undergrads or they were they were started out as like engineering teams that take in undergrads who sh- who don't know a lot about this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And they're like worried that they're not at the level of competition as like these larger companies that take in mostly graduate students and people who've like worked in industry for a while. And it's like. Mm-hmm. Uh, you shouldn't worry this much. Like you're actually doing really good, and you should realize that like there are a lot of other people at these other universities who want to like you know help out and um, you know who like want to collaborate on on building these things separate of the competition um, mm-hmm. because they 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 really want Hyperloop to be real. And while SpaceX is trying their best to like you know improve their their t- test track, and Hyperloop One is doing that as well. Everything everyone kind of seems to operate in their own silo, and there doesn't seem to be like um, a lot of, especially like in Western countries, a lot of collaboratives working directly with governments mm-hmm. and, and building out um, like actual like transport infrastructure separate of just like test tracks that they have on their own sites. Yeah, it's true. And, um, you know, it's it's been a number of years and you have been uh, following Hyperloop development for many years now. And, uh, you know, how did how did you get, you know, first interested about Hyperloop and, you know, what sparked your interest in it? Yeah, so uh, like similar to you and a lot of other people in the Hyperloop world, um, I, I read about a Reddit-based Hyperloop team. Um, I, I heard about it from like one of my friends, uh, Kevin. If you're watching this, thanks, bro, for letting me know about Hyperloop. But like, so he was he was telling me about um, this cool project he was working on um, and how he wanted to start a team at his university, but they didn't have one. So he ended up joining the the the, the Reddit Hyperloop team. Um, it, it was even more convenient for him because like they they would meet up like regularly mm-hmm. uh, in the Bay Area and they had like a, a test space and stuff yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. So uh, he even like let I even interviewed him like because I was trying to make like a video series about like um, oh, sustainable cool. technology development. Oh, cool. uh, and yeah, like I was I was like curious about his project, so I, I went and like filmed and like you know made this this interview series that I didn't really like get that far with <laughs> because of school and starting. Yeah. that kind of inspired me so much um because previous to that i was like working on on like seawater powered cars and like other forms of like new energy technologies oh, okay. and i kind of ditched that to work on hyperloop because i was like you know this is cool but like this would only impact like so many people and would mm-hmm. still like cause congestion and you know it's still not you're not creating a new supply chain it's still, there's still a lot mm-hmm. of problems right and whereas with Hyperloop, you're creating a whole new form of transportation from the ground up. And that really excited me. Um, so, yeah, I just joined the team at Davis and uh, I've been I've been the business team lead this entire year. And I've just recently decided to um, to leave that to, to work on some uh, to work more on, like, actually getting a Hyperloop test track built in Davis and building Hyperloop companies out here. I, I mean, I would love to talk to you more about that in one second. <laughs> but um, in this article that you wrote, um, you give a really good history of Hyperloop development and um, how it has, you know, come about um, and kind of the different twists and turns. And one of the things that you mentioned, I, I think it goes back to your video work and kind of sharing knowledge and doing an interview, is you, you want more direct communication and possibly a Hyperloop symposium um, in the future for all these teams. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what what would that look like? Would that you know, how, how, how might that manifest itself <laughs> with more direct communication between teams? I mean, like, the, the easiest, like, recommendation I gave was just, like, you know, keeping keeping Slacks, like, open and, like, having everybody, like, hop onto, like, you know, a public Slack. Okay. Um, I've seen this happen a lot with, like, a lot of, like, tech companies and stuff where, like, they're, they were, like, open source projects and then they kind of, like, are becoming more, like, companies. So they, 
they kind of start to close themselves off. But yeah. they still have like you know a Discord or a Slack or another like form of chat room open for people to like ask questions about their pod and stuff. Okay. Um, and then so I think that would be good. I mean, obviously it's like it's kind of like a no-brainer considering that like you know teams have Instagrams and like emails and, yeah. and ways that they can communicate. Yeah. But I felt that you know like that's still not very quick. Like usually there's some social media manager or somebody who like manages that, and it's just like more convenient if you had like a Slack where people could like, you know, interact at, uh, on one level and like see what and, and uh, be more up to date with things that are going on, mm -hmm. um, like general announcements and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then in terms of a symposium, um, yeah, like I, I see like, so a lot of teams are starting to like create their own technologies separate of like um, what was in, like the industry standard in uh, moving equipment and in, uh, in high speed rail. Uh, so when they're trying to do this, like they're trying to create, like write out a lot of papers and develop a lot of um, like new IP around this. So uh, there's definitely like a lot of students who um, feel very motivated to like get involved in something where they can get like, you know, a publication and they can get like oh, recognition. Yeah. Um, so I think that like that would be having a symposium would be like a very good reward system for students like who are usually grad students and PhD students to get more involved because Typically, it's been like undergrads who become like grad students and then they like run it or it's like people who are like, you know, already graduated from college or who are like, you know, they're they already knew about Hyperloop for a while and then they started a team. So I think like getting more more of like the grad students and PhD students who are working already on like electric vehicles and stuff mm -hmm. to get onto the Hyperloop uh, train would be like really good. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of who would organize this, uh, I guess like you could have like um varying levels since it's a symposium um mm -hmm. the best will be like having like uh representatives from every of the, one of the universities who are like part who want to participate like kind of being the the like the one to, to judge which kind of papers would come in mm -hmm. um since all i'm pretty sure like at davis you know we work with five engineering professors i don't think we'd be a team without the professors giving us a lot of guidance about how to build things, who to talk yeah, to, yeah. and like how how we could like create such a system. So I'm pretty sure most universities like they have to talk to their professors. So they would be great people to have uh, on a board like this, um, and then have like you know companies um, as either additional judges or like you know more mm -hmm. more sponsors mm -hmm. uh, that would that would like help kind of review a lot of these use these papers and. Um, yeah, I guess just create another place for people to collaborate beyond the um, beyond the Hyperloop competition, where every, every university is for themselves. You could have this like you know symposium where any any like you know somebody at UC Davis could work with somebody at at like UC Berkeley or somebody at Colorado School of Mines, and mm -hmm. they would still get a paper title. They still get all the like retributions of making a new thing, yeah. but and and developing Hyperloop. But it, it just wouldn't like you know they would collaborate with one another instead of like being. Um, feeling like they're isolated at their school trying to do, do the new technology on their own. That's, that's a good point. And, you know, we have seen, um, as you mentioned, the, a couple of Hyperloop symposium. One just happened in Colorado. Um, and, uh, you know, I was not able to go to that, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> um, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we also have seen uh, companies like Virgin Hyperloop One do the global challenge. And this is where they released, you know, um, they gave like you know the mandate. Please nominate your route. Do some research. Submit the research to us, and then you know we'll select some few global challenge winners. And um, you know that was really interesting. But we saw quickly that Department of Transportation's quickly won <laughs> the global challenges <laughs> because they're the Department of Transportation. They know everything that goes along between you know two cities. <laughs> you know how much airplanes, how many bicycles, how many you know, cattle go on, you know, semis, like, it's just crazy. Um, so yeah, you saw very different unequal. And then you had like very passionate people um, that had, you know, volunteers, um, you know, nominate routes like in Colorado, but also in Massachusetts, uh, you know, from Boston to New York City or something. And, you know, they're trying to build support and, you know, develop partnerships, but yet they just didn't have the bandwidth <laughs> to, to make a full, you know, court press. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I've, I'm aware of other, you know, competitions that have happened perhaps, but, um, having kind of a 
more organization around symposium and just communication would would help the overall kind of industry I think I, I would agree on that um, so as in your in your role at one loop um, you know maybe you didn't focus so much on the social media aspect of <laughs> documenting your team but um, you know these teams did a really good job this year on social media but um, yeah what would you what would you recommend to uh, you know for new teams in the future, uh, in in your kind of role for new teams? How would you you know expand your knowledge and recommendations for other people that might be filling your position in a Hyperloop Pod competition team? Uh, I think the the first thing that they should do is um, like identify, I guess the the amount of responsibilities they want to take um, as a business like team leader. Um, and I think like some teams have done really good jobs of this. Like I think Delft's team and like a few others have like, you know, they, they like, they don't have like a, like a team leader as such. I think like it's more like they have like different specializations within business and they have like one person each kind of like working on, on those things. Um, but like when it came to us, like I think I definitely was like over ambitious. I was like, um, you know, I was I started out like uh, I started out actually like not wanting to be the business team lead. So so I, I was on the I'm, I'm an engineering student. I'm a materials engineering oh, cool. uh, major, <laughs> and like I, I I've, you know I've been like very involved in like you know developing new technology and like uh, mm -hmm. like worked at a few companies and and I definitely thought I wanted to do more of those kind of things when it came to Hyperloop. But, um, you know, there was nobody who, like, had my knowledge uh, at the collegiate level, like, in terms of, um, you know, scaling social media platform, like, a social media profile, as well as, like, you know, like, building a branding, uh, like, building branding around your team, mm -hmm. building a good website, as well as, like, um, you know, finding sponsors, working with um, investment firms, working with different universities. Um, mm -hmm. So I was kind of doing this on the side at first. Um, where when I really like went, like, I guess became the f like full time like business team lead. Full time being that like you know instead of spending five hours a week on this and five hours on the propulsion team, I spent ten hours of my total hyperloop time on on the business team stuff. Um, that was like when I started working with like, one of our grant writers at UC Davis, uh, mm -hmm. as well as like a few other engineering students on writing a white paper about how we would actually make a track. In, in, wow. in Davis and Sacramento. Um, so when when it came to that, like basically my grant, the, the, the idea behind that was because like, like my grant writer was like starting to talk with um, the Sacramento Council of Governments about how, how they could possibly make Hyperloop. And he's like, oh, this guy's like really looking for, you know, um, input and like, you know, f f some sort of feasibility and like no one's really done that for this area. So mm -hmm. if you could like, you know, get, that would be great. And so that was like, one of the best projects I did because like I was running a team of like another 15 engineering students and we were like going after everything like you know um, how we would actually build the infrastructure um, who are some possible suppliers how we would like you know create Hyperloop businesses here in the area that would then like create better supply chain mm -hmm. um, what are some of the we even looked into the wildlife like problems that we've run into like I don't think any other Hyperloop white paper can like touch us in terms of the amount of birds we've looked at in our Hyperloop white paper like we tried to make it as much of a good point as possible and it worked like we ended up like the the guy read it and he really liked it and you know he was very supportive of us and wanted to help us in any way like kind of get investment and stuff to be able to like build it and then the wow. chancellor of our university read it and he's he was very helpful as well and he said like you know, if you're looking for um, any support, like these are some people you should talk to and you can possibly get support. So it did the job, but I, I obviously was not spending time on social media. And I was not spending time on other things, looking at, you know, our future and how to do that. And so, so right now, like how it manifested in the last year, because this was a year ago when we published this white paper, mm. um, not really published, but like, you know, sent it to like the different groups and like had it finished. Um, so in that year, like the basic one thing we had identified within our, our white paper was that we wanted to make an incubator for building Hyperloop businesses. Oh, cool. um, we didn't wow. see really anybody like trying to make like a full new supply chain for Hyperloop. Everyone was kind of like right. like trying to become another Tesla, I guess. Like they wanted to use all of the existing resources but be somehow different. And you kind of saw what happened with Tesla when they did that. Like they obviously like props to them. They outsold Mercedes Benz and they did 
crazily good. But like you know, they obviously their supply chain they had to like grow that exponentially quickly, mm-hmm. um, and they couldn't obviously do everything the way they wanted to. They had to like kind of do with deal with whatever they had available since they weren't able to you know redo everything right, like make steel factories and stuff. So um, so yeah, like we started this incubator like program, and that's what I'm helping run like like now instead of doing the hyperloop stuff and instead of me doing a business team lead. Um, we I found somebody who's like well I've been working with somebody who's like a, a like a managerial economics major who like you know does this kind of like he does he's very good at accounting he's like worked in a couple of like different firms in fact he's currently working at a real estate firm doing accounting for them so like you know he's somebody who's like much better at like keeping track of the books and like managing people to do social media and branding um, so I hope that with him and uh, having being more specifically aligned to that role he'd be somebody who'd be um, better for that but long story short like yeah figure out exactly what you want to do and like you know what everyone's strengths are and like what kind of students you're looking for because I, I like the mistake I made was I did I, I kind of asked my friends to join the team with me and I know everybody probably does that like and my friends were all their engineering majors but what I should have done is I should have gone on Facebook gone on LinkedIn and asked you know managerial economics students designers oh and God. I do this now but like well, a year ago, I didn't know this, and I was just a freshman at UC Davis. So, I, you know, really go and use LinkedIn, Facebook to get specified like majors, specified people to join your team and do that particular role. I guess is my advice. Whoa, it sounds like a CEO position <laughs> that you're working on. So, in your article, you give three different kind of ways Hyperloop has been developed. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on the different ways? these teams have come together yeah certainly so I mean you have like at the widest level you have kind of like three main buckets you have um, university teams that are participating in the competition you have uh, hyperloop startups uh, and then you have like um, these coalitions and nonprofits and uh, other like like non startup non student groups that like have come into play uh, so within the Hyperloop teams, you have your Hyperloop club teams. Um, so these are like, uh, you know, there are just a few students, usually undergrads, that want to start a club on campus, and they make, they decide to like participate in the Hyperloop competition. They work part time on this. Um, they're mostly getting like money from the university or from a few donors uh, who are alums. Um, so like some teams that like are, that follow this model model are like IIT Madras's team and then like even uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, they they mostly still have undergrads. Uh, then you have uh, the like you have like multi university like Hyperloop partnerships. So um, you have like Midwest Hyperloop, which represents University of Cincinnati, um, Purdue University, and uh, University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Um, you have Iron Loop and Iron. You know, you have these like groups who basically like they have smart students at at their schools who know other smart students at other schools who are not too far away. So they're like, oh, might as well like get them together um, and collaborate since they they either like made, since one team made it into top twenty and maybe the other team didn't, or maybe they just like didn't have the resources uh, individually. So together they could like kind of make something whole. Yep. Um, and then you have the full time like Hyperloop student teams. Uh, so like this would be like um, like Delft Hyperloop team, um, and I would also include like teams where like you know you have mostly like non undergraduates like graduate students as well as like people in industry who are like helping run the team, but it's still classified as a university team since they're like uh, an affiliate of the university. So you know these are a little bit like more intense because like they have more time to be able to work on this and they're mm-hmm. like. It made a very definite decision to like spend a lot of time to do this. So they're very similar in some ways, to, like how the startups are are created, but they're different in that like you know they still they still probably have some other job or they're like on campus doing stuff. So they're probably not like um, fully committed as much as like startups are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even within the startups, you have um, you have like uh, startups that um, have like a very like I guess uh, cohesive team. Like and I followed like the traditional startup model of like a group of founders get together and then they like um, grow together um, and scale the company. So Hyperloop One is an example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think even uh, Transpod is an example of that. Like mm-hmm. a group of few founder founders came together, thought this was a cool idea, got some investment, and like you know tried to make it bigger. Um, and then you have like these 
these new startups, which I find really fascinating in Hyperloop, that like you don't really see this anywhere else. You find these startups where you have like people around the world like working on one startup together, and they call it like a crowd sourced company i guess mm. it's like what they would like demonstrate as so you have like hyperloop transportation technologies the biggest mm -hmm. so like they started off as like a like uh, a crowdsourced engineering project on the platform jumpstart fund mm -hmm. and then they ended up becoming into like this um multinational company that like you know gives shares to to people around the world uh and then you have like our loop which at first was just a like you know another student team of sorts but they're also around the world, um, and then they've now become like a company that is trying to, um, you know, uh, they're trying like all sorts of new ways of like paying employees, of like managing um, votes and within the system. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to see like that kind of stuff develop. Or even Hyper Poland. Um, Hyper Poland mm -hmm. is, I think, more like the the first model. Like they're they're like a, you know a few founders who came together, but. It's interesting to see like how they they you know use crowdsourcing and crowdfunding mm -hmm. to kind of get a lot of engineering help as well as to um, get the funding they need um, to be able to actually like make uh, their first prototypes. Uh, and then you have the coalitions. Hmm. So the coalitions, um, you're probably very familiar with this since you helped run one. <laughs> uh, so like, huh? Yeah, Colorado Hyperloop. Colorado plug, Hyperloop. plug that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. very hardworking volunteers <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 for sure so like um you know colorado hyperloop is a big one and then there's missouri hyperloop coalition and there's you know just a lot of like concerned citizens people who like are interested in technology coming together to try to make um you know hyperloop like hyperloop to their town yeah um a lot of these were started like part of the um so spacex or hyperloop one sorry hyperloop one <laughs> Hyperloop One did a like a challenge to see like which places should basically like um, which routes they should develop for Hyperloop, um, and so these coalitions kind of rose at those times when people were starting to come together and say, hey, maybe we should try to get Hyperloop to come here, um, mm -hmm. and so they kind of represent you know people and and maybe the, the Department of Transportation in that in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's really cool to see like all these different models, and mm -hmm. I guess like the the model that I find. Um, that seems to work really well is um, the student team that then has like members who go on to start these startups um, mm. and then still continues to use crowdsourcing. I think like so kind of like a mix of them all is I think like the like best in terms of engineering because they get the the benefits of like being seen as students who are just like you know like trying something new um, at first. So they they have a lot of like room to fail, mm -hmm. and then like once they kind of get better at it, then they can like you know branch out and like um, start to get more advice from people who've done things like this in the past, and yeah. um, you know get build a bigger team and then raise funding like and and, and get information from people around the world, um, and then uh, they, but then they're still yeah. like you know they're still kind of like core Hyperloop people, I guess. Like they're still like, uh, like they, they have the engineering ability to build this because they've actually like built the pod and they've built like these things in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's why you see Heart Hyperloop, I think is like one of the most remarkable in that they're like able to, they actually have a test track, yeah. they have open support, they have like large investors. So they're definitely like plugging along at like a, a really uh, fast speed. Exactly, and I mean it's it's truly remarkable. The I mean they've demonstrated lane switching with their pod that we have yet to see any major Hyperloop company demonstrate, um, and like that's a major piece of technology to like move the pod to go down a different track and tunnel or tube. Um, but also um, Zelleros, you know that spun out of Hyperloop UPV. Then you have uh, Swiss uh, Swiss Pod. Um, that spun out of, I think, uh, EPF loop. Um, and I'm just trying to think. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a, there's quite a remarkable cohort um, that generated uh, new startup companies on Hyperloop. Um, and also Edinburgh University, HypeEd, a uh, spinoff um, with a tech company that uh, does, you know, Hyperloop uh, route uh, prediction and which, you know, what are the optimal uh, routes uh, for a Hyperloop possible uh, transportation mode? Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. So like, what well, I wanted to ask you is, um, so I think that like, I mean, I'm pretty familiar with like Hyperloop and stuff because I've been trying to like, uh, you know, help make my team and help 
help build an incubator for Hyperloop technology and whatnot. But I definitely am not as familiar as you because you've definitely spent so much more time in the trenches with all of these teams. So where do you think um, teams should really spend their time moving forward? And how um, can they better prepare themselves for actually building a real Hyperloop in their backyard? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think it's it's a lot of uh, what you're doing and just talking with other teams. I know uh, Hyperloop Pod competition teams always talk to other teams, you know, when they're spending the week in Hawthorne, California, and they're all trying to, like, you know, compare notes, basically, and, like, you know, see what the designs are and um, just kind of... Um, I guess one uh, uh, EPFL Hyperloop uh, engineer said it. He's like, I was really intimidated, you know, by the co- the competition. You know, I don't, you know, I didn't think I had the uh, technical know-how. I don't. I, he didn't think he had like the experience to develop, you know, the pods. But then, like, you know, he he realized that everybody else is in the same exact boat, like. Everybody else is having the exact same problems with, you know, their electronics, with their code, talking to the electronics, with <laughs> heat issues, you know, with certain subsystems, with, you know, calipers that were mis- a lot, you know, mismeasured and, like, all the measurements are off. Like, everybody's having the exact same um, problem. So I think what you're doing in, you know, trying to bring together kind of ideas and a conversation and maybe a pa- platform to kind of help bring together these groups, that's the best. Because, like, at the end of the day, you know, we're all humans and <laughs> we all want to see Hyperloop in the flesh and, like, ride on it and, like, you know, eliminate carbon emissions uh, with, you know, various other modes of transportation and get places really fast. Like, that's all we really want to see. So I think having... Uh, the work that you do in kind of bringing people together, um, that's probably the wisest solution at the end of the day. Um, because I know it's it's really hard when we go back to all of our different countries and cities and, you know, we hear negative articles like, oh, this thing can't get built, you know, oh, we don't have the money to do that infrastructure project. Oh, you know, you know it's not going to... Uh, contribute that much to help reduce climate change or something um well it actually does <laughs> it, yeah <laughs> it adds up um and you know there are different ways of funding there are different ways of building things there's different ways around things and um but you wouldn't know that if you just were by yourself so um my long-winded answer is just collaborate more uh with each other and basically do what you're doing (laughs) yeah trying to get that get the engineering talent together and um and you know the business talent and the political uh talent because this is a huge you know new technology that people are potentially scared about um there's a lot of like misinformation out there um there's a lot of you know entrenched technology already that's built in the physical world and so building something new uh, will have new you know, path dependencies and, you know, meaning. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's good to have kind of a, a place to communicate and share ideas. Yeah, I think I totally agree. And like, you know, um, like what we're doing here, like, well, at least what I'm trying to like get started here at Davis is like, mm-hmm. so we started a program called the, the Hard Tech Fund. Um, it's our first like small incubator program, like aiming towards possibly becoming a Hyperloop incubator in the next couple of years. Um, so we funded like three hardware projects this year, um, like from areas ranging from electric vehicles all the way through to like plastic recycling. And they're presenting to some investors um, in a couple of weeks uh, here in here in Silicon Valley. Um, so like I started this, I know it seems like kind of random, like how does this have to do with Hyperloop, but like I wanted to focus on just getting some projects like funded that are like focused on this like you know this new infrastructure and like developing like sustainable infrastructure before like you know, trying to get more money and offering equity for like the companies um in in future rounds um so like I, like because for me like the biggest the biggest fear i have is that hyperloop is going to become just like amtrak or just like another rail system um that already exists 
Uh, and there's nothing wrong with the system as such, but like you know, because they're such a large bureaucracy, things move very slowly. Uh, and we have the and we have the opportunity here, and we've seen a lot of people demonstrate that they can do something different. So I really want to like make like support anybody who wants to like build hyperloop technologies, um, you know, any type of technology that can help do that, so that we have a very like diverse competitive landscape. Like, if the landscape of what hyperloop becomes is what the internet is today. Which is what we all dream of. I think, like, or anybody who's like really, you know, big, been a big voice in Hyperloop. I think they've definitely like the vision that I see is like, you know, Hyperloop being this internet that connects all of us, like the physical internet, right? Yeah. That we get in and we can go, you know, anywhere between hundred and a thousand miles really quickly um, because so many like, you know, uh, so many stations and so many like so much connectivity would exist. And the only way we can get to that is if there's a lot of companies developing everything, like not just you know pods. But everything, like how we would build, like you know, the next linear induction motors. That, I mean, that's still a major project. But like everything from even like what materials we would use inside the Hyperloop pod um, for like the decreasing sound. Like I think there's just not that many people think it's like this one, like one size fits all thing that they have to like come up with the full solution on their own. But there's hmm. so many people out there that like want, you know, there's so many solutions that are just like these small little items here and there. And I definitely like want to help like empower that as much as possible. And I see, I see my role as somebody who's like worked in Silicon Valley and mm -hmm. like worked with investors out here. I see my role as connecting like those larger investors and like, you know, the, the talent we have here in Silicon Valley and in California um, to Hyperloop because I see a disconnect. There's oh. not really that much in for, there's not really that many people in, in like the Valley and like in the Bay area who are very optimistic about Hyperloop um, compared to, which is weird if you think about it, but like compared to the rest of the world, compared to Europe, it's definitely not as like the optimism is not there, especially since the high, the high speed rail did not work out. Um, yeah. 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 So I definitely like want to be that bridge. Um, and I hope that like, you know, anybody who's like interested in like, communicating with those kind of people can reach out to me and I'll definitely mm. be more than happy to try to help them with that. Um, and then I hope that like other people kind of like, you know, help create these kind of, um, systems in the places that they're from. Like I would love to see like, um, like I was reading about, uh, Dinklick's groundwork, um, the, mm. the cloud computing company out in India in indoor that had submitted uh, a, a request for, for developing hyperloop, um, between, uh, Mumbai and Delhi passing through indoor and I thought that was amazing like that a cloud computing company would want to like you know diversify into I guess the cloud computing of people like yeah. <laughs> communicating between your city so I think a company like that or like you know all these other companies in areas in the world could create these kind of like small funds that could then give money to like these projects or these teams and I'm honestly surprised that like Hyperloop One and like Hyperloop transportation technologies have not done this already because it doesn't take a lot of money to make new technology. Honestly, like hmm. I can tell you the first budget of some of the teams within our hard tech fund was like probably $500 and they were able to make, you know, really cool new technology. Cool. So if they, can, if they can do that here and you know, Hyperloop teams obviously are huge examples of that. They start out with thousands of dollars, then they, you know, graduate to like having you know, hundred thousand dollar like machines <laughs> that can take on like the Koenigseggs and the Remax of the world. So if they can do that, then and like you know they had pretty much the same resources as us all. We could easily do this if you know the teams were if if they were just given like that that like monetary incentive, like very small monetary incentive to like mm -hmm. really put in the effort to be able to do that. That's cool. Yeah, I I totally agree, and I see the ecosystem. Um, between the passionate enthusiast <laughs> who's kind of like, hey guys, let's, you know, let's, like here in Colorado, we don't even have a train line that goes along the front range. Like <laughs> there's, there's, there's a bus system uh, and that's new as of a couple of years ago. <laughs> and so like there was no public infrastructure for that. So um, it, it would be helpful to have connect, you know, the data centers that are in between Denver and Colorado Springs, like they, there's big, you know, money uh, in the state of Colorado that works on ITT infrastructure and other comp kind of companies that are not so high tech, um, but are tourism um, that would love to have, you know, faster, reliable transportation along ski resorts and stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's. I think there's a lot of uh, latent um, demand for this kind of a. a uh, infrastructure and uh, system that you're developing yeah most definitely and like i i'm i was born in colorado and like grew up okay. there so i totally know like like i remember the light rail coming up and everybody being super excited like you yeah. could go from 
you know, south end of Denver all the uh-huh. way to like Thornton yeah. in like a relatively shorter amount of time. And so many people wrote on that and like so many companies were able to develop in like, yeah. um, you know, in diff- different parts of Denver because they were on the light rail line. And I th- definitely see like, if if the city like is growing so much from that, I definitely want to see more invest. I, I was really excited when I saw Arivo and like Hyperloop One, like getting excited about Colorado. And when I heard about the Colorado Coalition, um, because I definitely saw that as as a great you know ecosystem with so much investment going towards startups and towards mm-hmm. um, developing new infrastructure like in in internet stuff. Mm-hmm. That I didn't see like the how far how, like. Uh, how far fledged, you know, Hyperloop would be. So I definitely hope that you know you keep fighting as well in Hyperloop because in, in Colorado, um, because that's what I'm trying to do out here in California with, you mm-hmm. know, um, with Silicon Valley and Sacramento. Yeah. Well, and how can people reach out to you? How can we get in touch with you and follow <laughs> what you're doing? Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, just uh, send me a message on uh, LinkedIn or Facebook. Yeah. It's like the easiest. Um, and then I'll also ask Blake to maybe like, you know, drop my email and like, yes. yeah, if you want to reach out, it'd be great. Yeah. Um, awesome. thank, well, thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate this, this interview and, um, it's, it's nice to, to hear exactly what you're up to, uh, out in the Silicon Valley and, um, your different initiatives because I've never heard of this happening yet. So this is a first, so. Yeah, same here, same here. Thank you so much for taking the time to interview me. And I definitely look forward to talking with you more in the future. Cool.